Future of the U.S. Navy. Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, is here with me. Captain Jerry Hendricks of the Center for New American Securities in Washington is our guide. And we're turning from nuclear to diesel boats. That's right. Diesel submarines. The Second World War is about diesel submarines. But here we are in the 21st century, and there is diesel submarine envy going on. The Swedes build and the Japanese build boats that are very desirable. And why? And what is the difference between a nuclear submarine and a diesel submarine? Uh, Scott Shipman joins, U.S. Navy retired, a chief. And Scott, chief, a very good evening to you. Thank you for this. All right, a simple definition. Nuclear submarine... Diesel submarine in the 21st century. What's the what is what is a major distinction between them? Why do we need both? Good evening to you, Scott. Good evening to you, John and Mary. Thank you for having me uh, with you. The major distinction between a nuclear submarine and a, and a diesel electric submarine is propulsion plant. Uh, the hull shapes are very similar to what they were. What between the two boats are very similar. So the 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 distinction between the two is a propulsion plant. A nuclear uh, reactor will take a boat much faster, uh, much longer endurance. A diesel boat uh, endurance is limited by the amount of fuel on uh, diesel fuel on board the boat, and uh, so that's the, that's the major defining difference between the two. So is one cheaper than the other? Uh, when you think diesel, you think ancient. Um, why would a country plump for diesel? Uh, well, economy is certainly a part of it. A, uh, a diesel electric submarine, worldwide, the average cost is about 500 to $600 million a copy. So a uh, Virginia, and as Dave Adams said very well, that you know Virginia is the best submarine in the world, but it can't be in everywhere. It can't be everywhere at once. So uh, from an economy point of view, I think our Navy would be well advised uh, to add a few diesel boats back into the fleet. We decommissioned our last one in 1989. Uh, but they are much less expensive. So, you know, the Germans have a great one. Uh, Saab, the Swedes are designing a boat they call the A26, which I believe, and I told Jerry this in another conversation, that uh, I believe the A26, when it's produced, is going to be pound for pound the best conventional submarine in the world. Jerry, but, uh, Jerry, you take up that cause. Yeah, there's, and there's additional reason for this, and I'd like Scott to, to talk about this. The fact of the matter is, is there's some water in the world uh, where diesel boats are, are a more natural fit. So it's not just an economy uh, issue, but, but it's actually a geography issue. You know, the oceans are not flat. Uh, what they look like under the water, varying depths, uh, you know, different types of, of, of mountainous terrain that's under the water. And in some cases, you know, a, a smaller diesel boat is, is advantageous. Uh, so, uh, Scott, could you comment, for instance, on the Baltic uh, as well as the East China Sea, South China Sea, and, and what, how those environments affect the types of boats that we deploy there. So that, that's a great point. Uh, the Baltic, for instance, the average water depth in the Baltic is 180 feet. Most, uh, most modern submarines are built uh, to navigate and operate at depths greater than 400 feet. Uh, in the Yellow Sea, the average depth is 144 feet. In the Persian Gulf, 164 or so. A diesel boat by, on scale is a much smaller boat uh, than a nuclear boat. So by definition, these boats can go into places uh, that a nuclear submarine, you can send a nuclear submarine in there, but the question becomes, when you have a precious asset that's limited in number, do you really want to risk a, a multi-billion dollar submarine in the crowded and contested littorals? I'm told that the Iranians have purchased diesel boats, and uh, they operate in the Persian Gulf. They operate in waters that are heavily contested all the time. Would Does that give the Iranians an advantage, theoretically, in the future, Chief? I'm dreaming a little bit, but it's the 21st century, and the Iranians are a hostile power. And can we contest their diesel boats with our nuclear boats? Well, we can certainly contest the Iranians uh, with our nuclear boats, but I would, the question I would ask is, at what cost? Uh, the, the, the Iranians have quite a fleet of small, relatively primitive uh, conventional submarines, diesel submarines, uh, and the one advantage that they do have is they're operating close to home, and their boats, when they're operating on the battery, that's the one piece that we haven't discussed here in the propulsion plant, is that diesel boats, when they're submerged, are usually on a battery. And when a submarine is on a battery, when a diesel submarine is on a battery, they're practi if, if, if they're engineered correctly, they're practically invisible to sonar. So uh, I would submit that in naval warfare, attrition has been, has, has 
informed every battle uh, easily in the modern era that numbers numbers are going to count. So, uh, yes, our boats could certainly uh, take care of the Iranian problem, but at what cost? Would we lose, in other words, would we lose a boat or could we lose a boat? And I think that we, if we plan correctly, we ought to at least consider the fact that we may. Well, batteries, it sounds like a great project for Elon Musk, except without <laughs> the taxpayer backing, maybe. Yes. Um, a question for you, then. Uh, uh, what about the compatibility of these boats with the, uh, with the IT systems that we have here in the United States? We want to communicate and coordinate with our allies. Is there any problem with that? What, what's the sophistication level of a boat like that when it comes to tech? Do you just plug it in and they're just like a nuke? Uh, they're very similar. Uh, we operate routinely with our allies. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Swedes loaned us, or we leased a boat from Sweden for two years, the Gotland class uh, diesel electric boat, and it stayed in with a crew in San Diego for a couple of years and operated essentially as a target for our uh, nuclear uh, powered fleet. And an interesting anecdote uh, to that is that when they did the first few exercises, when the Swedish boat operated with ours, uh, our boats could not find them on a battery. Wow. So they had to put a noisemaker on the boat in order in order for our boats to be able to find them. All right, I'm convinced. Uh, the Batman question, does it come in black? Uh, Jerry, how many <laughs> of these do we need? Why don't we have one? Well, this is a great question. And, and uh, you, know, and, you know, I often have talked about the high-low mix approach. And, and, you know, there's a, that general question, you know, can we afford, you know, Dave talked about we need 72 submarines. The fact is we can't afford to go with 72 nuclear submarines. But if we did a high-low mix where we would buy one Virginia class and perhaps two or three uh, of the diesel boats to cover down on some of our requirements in some of these more shallow water environments, uh, then, in fact, we could rapidly grow the submarine force. And, in fact, some of these boats that are coming on right now uh, are coming uh, perhaps more fully equipped. Uh, in the past, these submarines came with torpedoes uh, only or perhaps mine laying. Now they're able to launch torpedoes or missiles or mines. And I wanted to ask Scott... Uh, we just have 20 seconds. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, Scott, could you go over a little bit about what AIP is to explain to the listeners? Uh, 20 seconds, Scott. Uh, air independent propulsion is a propulsion plant that operates independent of the exterior atmosphere. It allows the boat to stay submerged for about two weeks uh, without snorkeling. Uh, that sounds like an advantage. Uh, Scott, last question. How many do we need? Five, 10, 15, 72? What do you want? Uh, at least 20. Okay, uh, got boats. it, got it. 72 nukes, seven, uh, attack boats, and 20 diesels. We're coming up. Mary Kissel, Jerry Hendricks, I'm John Batchelor with Scott Shipman. I'm John Batzler with Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, and Mary and I are with the future of the Navy. As of now, we're okay, right, Mary? We've gone through attack boats, nuclear attack boats, and we didn't sink, and we, we then dealt with a whole concept that I had never known about, uh, diesel boats in the 21st century, and yeah. we still didn't sink. And now I think we need to go to something much, much smaller, John Batchelor. Right. This is drone submarines, which have a special language. Jerry Hendricks, of course, of the Center for New American Security, continues with us as our guide so we don't get in too much trouble. Jerry's retired Navy. Now we're welcome... Uh, Paul Shari of the Center for New American Security, who is writing about and speaking of the concept of drones. These are not quite AI robots. These are commanded by human beings. But the concept of drones underwater, I first want to establish what to call them. Uh, Paul, a very good evening to you. What do you call a drone submarine? Does it have a name? Does it have a classification? Good evening to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the Navy calls them unmanned undersea vehicles, or UUVs. Um, sometimes they're called autonomous undersea vehicles, because a very important difference in drones or UUVs undersea versus drones in the air is because communications are so challenging underwater, they are largely very autonomous, which is very different than, say, a Predator drone in the air, which is essentially remotely controlled. So when you say autonomous, do you send them out onto search or reconnaissance missions? And how do they sustain themselves? Do they have underwater charging stations? How does that work? Well, power is definitely a limiting factor um, for torpedo-shaped UUVs. 
that becomes a, a limit depending on the size of the vehicle, maybe for hours, maybe a few days, and then they need to come back to be charged up. People have talked about networks of charging stations under sea that could keep a steady stream of vehicles rotating for months at a time, um, although that's, that's really in the concept stages now. There are glider UUVs that tap into the energy and the thermal clines of the oceans, and they can stay at sea for years at a time, fully autonomous on their own. Years at a time? Yeah. <laughs> Just back up yeah. there. You said years at a time. That's right. Doing uh, doing oceanographic missions. Is that real now, uh, today? Can they do that today? Yes. Yes, real today. Uh, Jerry, we're wandering into science fiction here. Go ahead, Jerry. No, actually, we're not. We're 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 wandering into reality, which is something that's not fully appreciated, you know, by most of the American people, or or for that matter, the international audience. Paul, you, you wrote in the past, uh, you know, for instance, you you raised uh, DARPA's project for the uh, what we call the anti-submarine warfare continuous trail unmanned vessel, the ACTUV, which is a surface vessel. Um, is there something that's analogous to that, that that's being looked at right now that we're aware of in the underwater environment? Well, there are a suite of different UUVs or autonomous undersea vehicles. Um, there are torpedo size, anywhere from sort of, sort of torpedo size vehicles to very small ones, things that would be maybe the size of a, a baseball bat, to large diameter UUVs um, that are basically mini subs. And, and so they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, but again, under sea, power is a big difference. So while the, the active uh, that you refer to, or the, the sea hunter, it's now been christened, um, you know, as a surface ship can then draw on things like diesel power, under sea, that's obviously much more challenging. I want to imagine what the underwater future looks like. Paul, and use the analogy of what I've learned about how the Air Force is thinking about drones. Not operating autonomously or independent, but operating in a, in a, in a network with manned aircraft, a stealthy, say, an F-22, so that they augment the attack profile. Uh, they have special language in the Air Force, but I, I'm trying to describe generally something that looks like robots and man working together. Is there such a thing for underwater vehicles working with attack submarines? Absolutely, and we're, we're headed there. Um, people use terms like manned, unmanned teaming, um, essentially, imagine submarines aren't going away. Uh, you're not going to be able to, to build an undersea unmanned vehicle that can replace all of the functions of a, a manned attack submarine or certainly a ballistic missile submarine. But think of the, the submarine now as the mothership and almost like, it, like an aircraft carrier undersea and then a swarm of undersea drones that may be coming from the submarine, that might be coming from land, they may be coming from pods where they're pre-positioned undersea, and they're communicating via a network, and the submarine is the hub. It's the, the command and control hub that's then getting information from that network about where our enemy submarines are, and then feeding out orders so that these other drones go track enemy submarines, and then manned attack submarines go and hunt them down. Is this an area where the U.S. really has technological superiority, or are there other nations who are developing this kind of technology? There are many other nations, and that's a, that's a really important issue. Right now, the U.S. has a very big advantage under sea, but this technology is much more accessible than building an attack, you know, a nuclear attack submarine. That's hard. Small, unmanned, autonomous vehicles under sea, that's much more accessible by even, you know, middle, middle powers. And so this is the kind of thing where if the U.S. military went into it big, it could use it to double down in its advantage. But if the U.S. Navy, you know, ends up sort of kind of taking a half step in this direction and others invest big in undersea vehicles, that could start to erode the U.S. advantage under sea. Jerry, Jerry, I want to turn it over to you, but I just had this vision as Paul was talking. You recall the years 1929 to 1941. We were going on the idea that the big gun club made us 
safe. And then the Japanese invented a weapon called the Kido Butai, and we were not ready. So is anybody inventing an underwater swarm of attack Jelly, submarines, jellyfish something like that? Or something. Or say something yeah. from East Asia. Is there anything out there cooking like that, Jerry? Well, well, clearly a lot of people are thinking about this, and in fact, Paul is, is doing a lot of, uh, of work in this realm as he's trying to bring the concepts of these things together. But the thing that I think that's important, because it's been a theme all through the night, is, is we all recognize that the U.S. has a lot of commitments around the world, and our Navy is getting smaller, and we can't afford to have the size of the Navy we want. And yet individuals like Paul are, are describing a world with some of these smaller platforms that are, will be cheaper and yet more numerous that will allow us to maintain long-term presence in the air, on the surface, and under the surface, monitoring things that could provide queuing uh, to man platforms. And I'm wondering if Paul could talk a little bit about how these things are networked, how they're drawn together. Um, you know, how do we knit a, a large constellation of these types of platforms uh, together to give us an overall picture? Sure. So there, there are a number of different concepts about how to do that. Um, one would be to lay a series of uh, cables under sea with uh, fiber optic cables with different docking stations that could be used for both communications and for power so that vehicles would go out on patrol and then they'd come back, repower, and then transmit um, data. That's certainly one way that this could be done to monitor an area one of the challenges is going to be because of communications underwater, the, the pace of communications will be slower because there may be a time delay from when the drone is out doing its reconnaissance mission before it comes back and links up with a submarine or a surface asset and then transmits its data. The other thing that people are talking about is multi-domain swarms. So having un un undersea drones surface unmanned ships, and then aircraft drones, all operating together as a way to, to get away with some of this communications problem, so that instead of trying to pass comms undersea, the UUVs pass data to surface vessels, which then pass data to drone aircraft that then relay it via satellite or, say, to surface ships or to aircraft carriers. Is this something we want to be talking about on yeah, the yeah. airwaves? Yeah, no, it's fine. I mean, I, it's fine. Science fiction that, already did it. He just talked about Skynet. We've, okay. did, we've already okay. seen the movie. Okay. Arnold Schwarzenegger was fabulous when he was younger. Just asking. Yes. Just asking. Uh, Brett, Skynet, Skynet is uh, in debate, Paul? Is that, what you're, is that what you just said, that they're already looking at this at the Pentagon? Well, these are, I mean, I don't want to over-hype over the, the artificial intelligence aspect of it. These would be things that would have, they'd be autonomous, they'd be operating on their own, but be very simple yeah. in terms of their intelligence. Much more like a self-driving car. So I don't, I don't think there's anything to be afraid of, uh, certainly in terms of the, the drone swarms rising up against us. Um, but these concepts about networks, multi-domain swarms, working cooperatively, they exist certainly on paper, and we're starting to see the early stage of them come together in research labs, um, it's all very, very early research. The Naval Postgraduate School is doing very interesting research on swarm combat with aerial swarms, with drones in the air, but some of the lessons could certainly apply to swarms in other domains as well. Paul Shari of the Center for New American Security. I won't open my checkbook to him, Jerry. He'll bankrupt us. <laughs> all right, fine. Jerry Hendricks of the Center for New American Security. Captain Jerry Hendricks, U.S. Navy retired. Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. And I'm John Batchelor.